Rightio. Who wants to kick off with a hot question? Burning questions anywhere? Don't let me down, team. I'm going to ask Suze a question first. Um, Suze, if you've got a place on your farm, some non-arable sort of country, could you broadcast subtropical pastures seed in there and be successful, or would you recommend more disc or seeding, seeding into that sort of situation? Uh, Jeff, you could, but the likelihood of success is low, and it would, yeah, I. I for the cost of the seed, it's worth doing it properly, doing it once and doing it properly. So it's not what I would recommend. Very good. Yeah, Gordon, you spoke about um, having uh, wheat um, as your main cereal when um, you had loosen over the top of your legumes. Just from your knowledge of other plants, say oats and barley or ryegrass, um, as a um, with your knowledge of those plants, what would your gut feel be in terms of over-sowing loosen to get a, a, a complete um, or more complete um, mineral balance for, for sheep? Uh, okay, so generally the results will be about the same. Each of those different cereal types have slightly different concentrations of the different minerals. Uh, so one of the features of oats is that it's actually quite salty, which is a good thing. Uh, but it also has a very high uh, dietary cation and iron difference. So it's got a lot of potassium and the extra salt, sodium, uh, and it doesn't have a lot of sulfur and chloride, and that affects vitamin D3, basically. So you get a different kind of challenge. Would lucerne fix that problem? I don't think it would. It would probably make it worse, because lucerne's got a fairly high DCAD, and we had quite high DCADs with lucerne and perennial wheat. So, uh, no, I think you still need the same mineral licks available. Uh, and maybe even think about a calcium if you just go with lucin. And no, you don't need about calcium with a lucin. So just a magnesium and a salt will be fine. Doesn't matter the combination of cereals. Uh, Rowan, you touched on um, some sowing rate stuff with Saradella. Um, sorry, here. Uh, just curious, um, in terms of like subclover, coated subclover sowing rates, um, where do you think we should be sitting at, whether it's with a loosened subclover or a grass subclover mix for establishing new pastures? What should those subclover sowing rates be around? Yeah, it's a good, good question. Probably, uh, we're, we're really lucky in Tassie not to have to sow too much subclover, so my experience with sub is that generally we're only putting it in a mix at very low rates of sort of one to maybe two in, in places, um, kilos of the hectare. We, like I say, we've got big seed banks of it down there and if we try, we actually have trouble introducing a new cultivar uh, down there because of what we've got in the background. So generally we've got um, Mount Barker, a uh, bit of wood genella, um, and probably Denmark is one of the, one of the cultivars that are the best place for us down there, but we've got big backgrounds of that. So. Um, if you're sowing again, I, I think you'd be wanting uh, a much higher, much higher rate than that. But obviously, it will depend on what you've got in the seed bank and whether or not you actually need to spend that money on extra seed or, or what what you've got in that seed bank. So, um, yeah, that that'd be my answer. Yeah, just a question to you, Gordon. What uh, relationship are we seeing between uh, some of those minerals in the soil and what you're getting through into the plant, uh, mainly on grazing cereals? Yeah, it's an excellent question. Uh, the relationship is fairly simple. The higher the concentration of potassium in the soil, the more problems you're going to have. So there are, in Western Australia, for example, they've got very low potassium, very high sodium soils, and they really tend not to have a lot of these sorts of problems on the grazing cereals. Uh, and uh, with Richard Hayes, they had a site down at Bredalbin, which was a very low potassium site as well, uh, and we could hardly push these ratios into very dangerous levels um, down in that environment. So fertiliser history with potash is a part of the story. If you had saline ground underneath, maybe, like you, I'd probably test the forage first to know if there's a change. Um, so simply, high potassium soils, high potash fertiliser history increases the risk of very high potassium in your forage 
and that'll drop out sodium because they compete. So as you drive up potassium, the plant will absorb less sodium, less calcium and less magnesium. And calcium and magnesium sort of a bit like that. Sometimes statistically significant, sometimes not. But the rule is it goes down. So it becomes riskier. So high potash system history, high phosphorus, so high potassium soils, higher risk. And that increases the requirement for mineral supplementation, cause mag lime and salt. Um, Brent Alexander, Sue. Um, are you aware of you've done any work on uh, pasture cropping in conjunction with the, uh, the tropicals? Uh, not down this part of the, not, not down in southern New South Wales. Um, in northern New South Wales, we've done a little bit. Um, our experience is, well, I, I work pretty closely with a, um, a hydrologist and um, he has a saying that uh, you can only use your water once. So we find with pasture cropping that, uh, that it, we tend to run out of water. So, um, yes, yeah, so it's probably not something that we tend to, tend to recommend because we just don't get the water in order to be able to, for, for, the, for the crop to be, to be of any use. Gordon, just a question. Um, you mentioned it before about, again, and I think it's just been raised again about those high, you know, uh, potassium soils. Um, and you mentioned there earlier about the, uh, the decab value of, of, the, uh, of the pasture. Um, and generally, sort of the two of them go hand in hand, where you get the high potassium, your decab areas are generally more of a, of a prevalence issue that you'll have. And which can be sort of counteracted with uh, magnesium, um, is when you're, when you're using magnesium, is it just magnesium oxide or would a magnesium sulphate be a better option? Uh, so there were studies looking at magnesium sulphate and that, was, that work was as a sort of a fertiliser broadcast across the paddock, which worked fine. Those studies focused on growth rates of lambs, not on the excretion of magnesium in urine. Uh, I don't think there's a lot of difference necessarily, if, but it's about palatability and, and to a degree it's also about how uh, absorbable. So magnesium is generally not very palatable. You can offer it as dolomite, which is calcium and magnesium, uh, but you need to probably offer about four or five times more um, than if it was just cause mag. So cause mag's cost effective and that's the way to go, much simpler. Don't worry too much about the O, the oxygen. Just focus on the magnesium. Thank you. I've got a question for Rowan. Uh, Rowan, you, most of your work is all based around Cerradella, and there's probably been some work in our region here that put Bicerula as a, probably a, a higher product productivity species for this part of the state. Um, have you guys done any comparison through your trial work at all? No, the, um, I've had no experience with vice ruler at all. I know that the, um, there's a low rainfall annual legume project going on at the moment um, with, uh, I think, Belinda Hackney here in New South Wales working with the um, South Australian and the Western Australian guys on that. Um, I actually just saw a tweet before of them out in a the field somewhere close by um, looking at um, some field evaluation of some of those legumes. So. Um, hopefully that information will come online soon and, and like I say, that Cerradella project's in its early stages um, working, working with CIRO and New South Wales DPI here um, and, and we're adding few more sites in Tassie so hopefully over the next couple of years we'll have some good recommendations coming out of that relating to Cerradella but like I say, there is other project work going on so yep. that'll come online pretty soon. Yep, thanks. Um, a question for Gordon, Kendra Kerisk from Coolerman. Um, just regarding grazing crops and without, I mean obviously there's heaps of variables, but is it fair to assume that if animals are taking the supplement that you're putting out, that they need it and when they stop taking it they don't need it? Because, like, it, I mean it's possible to know without doing forage testing and, and without knowing what proportion of their diet is coming from 
the different um, um, plants in this ward. Like I'm just, I kind of, I feel like we're sort of stabbing in the dark when we're putting some minerals out and not really knowing what they need and what they don't. The dark arts of the sheep brain, um, <laughs> do they really want it? So I think about this often. So if we had a diet, if we just ate chocolate all the time, just chocolate, I reckon we'd be reaching for the brand, right? And I don't think we need to read a paper about it to know that we should be reaching for the brand. Does the sheep f feel the same way? It, it surely would. So in the, I showed this uh, a, a little chart where we had the concentration, the amount of mineral consumed in these animals across six different plots over a 12-week period in my presentation. And towards about week 9, 10 and 12, they started to eat significantly less lick. Why? Okay, so the feed base, well, we're still waiting for the mineral tests to come in because I think it was 1,000 mineral samples we had to send away, right? So a pretty big data set. It's possible that as the plant matures, and what we, what we do know is that as the plant matures, those ratios change. Potassium decreases and sodium, calcium and magnesium start to increase in concentration. Does the feed become safe? No, I don't think so. I think the animals still need it. Do they become bored of it? I don't know. I don't know. So can we make an interpretation around it? Um, maybe uh, it needs a lot of work. Um, if they're not eating the minerals, uh, do you take them away? I wouldn't do that. Um, if they're bored of it, maybe you'd add sugar. That'll help to get some animals onto these minerals sometimes to maintain it. Because what we do know is that while the leaf is there, while it's still eating leaf, uh, and for these particular types of plants, that skewed ratio is still there. So the risk is still there. Um, and I would do that as a rule for twin bearing ewes in late pregnancy and lactation in particular. They are the highest risk. They have the highest demand for magnesium and calcium. Uh, would you do it for lambs that are about to go on the truck? They're not eating the lick? Don't worry about it too much. But if it's right at the start and you've got a 10 week period ahead of you and maybe you're feeding some grain and you're not adding any supplements to the grain, uh, then you're on a pathway to osteoporosis or rickets. Mm. So it's, I guess, a bit by scenario, but I would continue to provide those licks with the feed base that challenges that mineral health. Question from Gordon. Uh, based around a slide of Sue's there previously, um, we've got some tropical pastures growing on some fairly light granite sorts of soils. Um, uh, yeah, pastures were looking good, nice and leafy, but then we've measured some fairly low growth rates off them, uh, yeah, particularly in young sheep. So just wondering about that, uh, the salt and the potassium thing, uh, yeah, well, particularly in the context of those lighter granite soils. Okay, so um, I can't guess what is happening in the soil for soil fertility on the granites, except probably generally moderate to low, is it? Guess? Yep, um, fairly familiar with the country. Congratulations having established tropical pasture in those soils. Um, so yeah, so provide a lick of salt, uh, and if you're not getting the growth rates, I'd, I'd still think about grain supplementation just to poke it along, because if the energy is dropping down, uh, then that's going to be one of the limiting nutrients as well, um, as well as the salt. So I, I'd think about that. Um, but if they're also, uh, you know, it could be, I mean, Nigel talked about in his presentation, just different histories of, you know, fertiliser programs and recent use might be a part of it. So Nigel can put that little story together. You, you'll have to do it for yourself, but I'd certainly provide a lick it's not going to affect their health, I don't think, dramatically, but I think you'll still get a gain. It'll be a small gain, but it'll be a gain. Got one here. So I was just going to ask if you've seen the pastures at all in a mixed farming system and sort of what, how the soil has benefited from them, say, when you transmission back to crop, or has anyone really transitioned back to crop after having subtropical grasses at all, or do you think they're just sort of stuck with the grass and that's it? I wouldn't say they're stuck with the grass, <laughs> but maybe but you're talking to the wrong person. Um, I'm not aware of, of 
To be perfectly honest, up our part of the world, they tend to go in and they stay in. They're not, they're not in a rotation, they're there for the long haul. Um, I know of, um, there was one producer who put in some tropicals and uh, he, he wasn't happy with them. Um, he had a um, first cross, second cross um, system and, um, and he wanted, yeah, he wanted to maximise his animal production. So he was going, going more, you know, more for these um, and your forage is high, you know, high, um, high quality. So he pulled his out, um, but I'm, I'm not aware of having any, any issues with them going back into a system. Um, I think you probably, there may be issues with um, disease um, going back in. No, Lindsay's shaking his head at me. Do you, would you like to answer that question? Really good for soil carbon. You can have a challenge with demineralisation and tying up nitrogen in the first phase coming out of a tropical grass into a cropping phase. They, some of the tropical grasses do host fusarium, but not at high populations. Um, but really good for nematodes and things like that. So non-hosts, most of those species. So good for a disease break, very good for that. Good for soil structure and those sort of things. It's the same as you get from a temperance. But, but apart from that, dry soil profile, like out of loosen. So they're the main things, at least from what I've done, yeah. Yeah, um, I think with pre Premier Digit, it's horses for courses. Um, and Premier Digit will grow where nothing else will. If you've got problem weeds you want to choke out, like um, spiny burr grasses, anything you want to choke out, it'll choke it out. It'll self-seed. Um, when we were feeding Macosca brew, which is a urea-based loose lick out, and we were throwing a peach tin of seed in every time we put it out, the dung beetles eat, the cow, cattle were eating the lick, poop it out, dung beetles bury it, rains, and we ended up with premier digit monocultures everywhere where we did that. So it is a very good self-seeder. What you've got to look at with premier digit is what else will grow there and proliferate? Bugger all. That's where its fit is in some of these countries. To plant it in some of your really good country and try and push um, land production, you're dreaming. It's not rocket fuel, but what it is is somewhere to park dry breeding animals, sheep or cattle, when the shit's hitting the fan as far as carrying capacity and the season's closing in on you, geez, it'll run some animals. And what I love about it is it, it just gives you that break in summer to let your temperates recover root mass underneath and let them go into recovery. If you've got 20% of your farm premier digit, you can basically destock the other 80% for right through summer if that's what blows your hair back because it just produces. So it's just something to fill a feed wedge. I wouldn't say it's production feed. It is with cattle, not so much with sheep but it will thrive and survive and, and fill in all bare patches in the worst soil. I'm talking um, um, high aluminium, pH soils, um, silver grass soils, um, cape weed soils, where all you've ever grown silky grass, cape weed, it'll fill in all those holes and you just gotta celebrate that you've got something there running a high capacity, a lot of DSEs, where once before it run you wouldn't run a go enter on it. So that's the way I look at Premier Digit. It grows and proliferates where nothing else will, and it will also perform incredibly bloody well on your best soils. It's a winner, but don't put your whole place in with it, for God's sake. It's a, it's a really good point. I might just add to that. That's a, spot on, Nigel. I totally agree. Uh, two things. Like with uh, uh, grazing cereal crops, CSRO did some modelling and you don't want more than about 15% of your farm in under grazing crops because you've got to rest that area while you're waiting for the germination and anchoring and adequate growth and then when you lock it up, uh, your animals are off and so the rest of your farm, particularly the pastures, are taking all the workload. Uh, so there's a very fine balance in there and I think 15%, I think in reality, doesn't, is, is also too high. But just another thing with lamb growth, I'll put my other, I'll take my plant hat off and I'll think about animal production. Last summer and up to now, still we've had a lot of problems with worms. Uh, so be mindful to do regular worm egg, egg counts when you think your growth rates are falling off. 
and then after you've done a drench, make sure you do another worm egg count test to know if the drench worked, because that's a very poorly adopted practice. So worms have been a big issue this year. Um, hello. Um, I was just wondering um, how important it is to try to increase earthworm count for the aeration of the soil and your plant root regrowth, and also um, the issue of trying to encourage native grasses that are particular to your area? That's a good question. Um, I'll have a go. And then it's you not my field. <laughs> um, cert certainly in Tasmania, um, we've uh, spent uh, a great deal, particularly in our um, run country. Um, a lot, quite a few farmers have got covenants on their land and, and really trying to maintain areas of of native pastures, um, that, that, that's included low rates of herb, um, low rates of fertiliser applied, only grazing at certain times of the year and the like. Um, the majority of anywhere that's been disturbed or, or um, I guess, um, you know, sown down to exotics before, that's, you know, pretty much stayed like that. There hasn't been much work reverting back to, back to natives uh, I, I guess for a number of reasons, probably, probably around um, those soils being far more productive under an exotic, um, and, and really farmers trying to drive productivity. Um, I, I think part also part um, the difficulty in getting those native grass species that might be um, really, uh, I, I guess, adapted to that that particular environment is often, often a challenge. Um, the other, the other thing I do see, though, is in the, in the space of multi-species mixes. Um, there's certainly a lot of interest, particularly through Victoria and down into Tasmania at the moment, with multi-species mixes. Um, and, and when I say multi-species, I'm talking sort of upwards of 6 to 20, what, what I call mixed pastures. You know, having, having a, a one, maybe two grasses, a legume and a herb, that's... That's what I call mixed pastures, but multi, multi, actual multi-species sowings, I think, are coming, becoming more popular and it's something that needs, uh, I guess, uh, another level of um, research done on them to, to actually see what they are contributing. Um, and uh, uh, to your point on, on worms and ev everything, you know, soil health in particular, there's a lot of, um, I guess... Um, uh, commentary around the benefits that that's having and I think you know I'm certainly open open minded to whether that um, you know is, is will end up being a, a productive benefit or whether whether it's it's more a conservation benefit and whether there's I guess a sweet spot in between that we can reach so um, I, th I think it, it's certainly of interest there's money going into it there's uh, I guess there's a lot of interest in that type of work at the moment and, and I think for that to be taken up we really need to see some good good experimental work done on it and but we know that, uh, that I guess the stacking benefits of what is um, you know what is claimed I guess on, on those things takes a number of years to do so it's not something that we can achieve in a in a two-year pasture trial it's something that we need to um, put in the ground and, and manage over time so um, uh, I, I think we will start to see some more work done on it and, I, and hopefully we can start to see some of those outcomes of it. Sue, so, um, I've got a question for you on your work. Um, based on the, the work you've done to date, are we, would you have a recommendation of two, three species that we should be trialling as a new grower or are we still looking at shotgun mixes? Which way would you be looking at it? <laughs> um, fr from all the work that we've been doing, so I've, I've just recently tried to pull everything together for a range of different sites, and uh, Digigrass and Bebatsy Panic consistently come to the top. Um, there for the longer term persistence and um, productivity. Um, in this part of the world, so Ben Batsy Panic, you need a, a heavier soil for it to be, to be persistent and productive. Um, and so yeah, if you've got a, a neutral to a more alkaline soil, then Ben Batsy 
and um, digit mix would be good. If you're on a more acid soil, then, then uh, digit grass is probably the grass to go. Um, you might put a bit of uh, Rhodes grass in there, but it potentially won't last long term. Yeah, and just following on from that, um, from the growers who have already been using it, how are they ch modifying their grazing management with the introduction of subtropicals? Um, what, what DC are they having to push to to get some control or haven't they been able to control it yet? I think that might be a really good question for the floor. Would anyone like to contribute to that one? Um, can I actually just ask, sorry, I don't want to hijack your question. Um, who, who here is actually, um, has got some tropicals in? Who's, who has sown a tropical pasture of any description? Hands up high so I can count you. One, two, three. Um, who, who is considering it and might consider growing something, say, in the next sort of three to five years? Get my hands up high, please. So three versus one, two, maybe ten. Okay, all right, thank you. Um, yeah, so for those of you that have got um, tropicals in, are you, do you feel in a position to be able to answer Jeff's question? How are you, how are you utilising it in your system? Um, any agronomists, are you in a position to be able to say on how your clients might be using it, please? No one's game, Jeff. Had to find someone. No, it's all right. Um, I planted it about 12 years ago, and I use roads, console love grass, and digit. And the, the roads died out after about three years. It just disappeared. Um, the love grass is still there, but the digit's the one that dominates. Um, this year I ran, it's only 50 acres, so I ran about 400 years on it for about three months this year, and it's, I just took them off oh, about a month ago. And it's back down to this high. But you don't get any bathurst burrs. This paddock had a heap of blue heliotrope in it. Don't see that anymore. I don't spray it. I don't do anything with it. I just let it grow. And there's clover there now. But yeah, like no, I said, it grows on anything. This paddock wouldn't grow anything else except oh, clover, but I couldn't get grasses to grow on it. And this stuff just grew. And the first year I grew it, it got up this high. Because I said to let it set seed, so I let it go for the, through for the first year and just, you couldn't drive through it. It's that bloody thick. But yeah, it's a good, good summer gap feed. Um, yeah, it works well for me. Um, what proportion of your property do you have? Oh, it's only 50 acres. 50 I'm going to put some more in this year. Yeah. Um, because I think you need at least two inches of rain before, prior, uh, after sowing. So you've got to sow it and then get two inches of rain and that, that gets it sort of going. All I could see when I first did it was black grass. But then we got more rain in the, around Christmas and that's when it just took off and it didn't, hasn't looked back. Excellent. Mm. So it's good. One thing it does love is being flogged, flogged mercifully. And what happens is if you harvest and harvest and harvest and you give it, um, in summary, if you've got okay rainfall, you'll only be on a 21-day rotation back onto it. And if you go to sleep, you've lost it. It grows that quick. It'll be gone in two weeks where it's gone into um, a jungle and that's when you're your dry matter just rapidly decreases because it goes into reproduction. So if you love flogging pastures, this is the stuff for you. If you absolutely hate grass and want to eat everything, this is the plant for you. But the good thing about flogging it right at the end of summer is you're setting it up for subclover. And if you leave a heap of litter there, like I'm talking extreme litter, say four inches deep, you won't see your sub. So that's why um, abuse and subclover, they both fit in well together. 
Rhodes grass disappears in three years. Bambachi is that palatable. They will find every plant and eat it out of existence, no matter how good your rotation is, because it's so palatable. I love it. So for me, what I've seen is just Rhodes... Ro uh, Premier Digit, Premier Digit and Premier Digit and some more Premier Digit in the mix would be good. Bicerula grows well with it in all soils, but subs, put the subs in there because the subs love country that's flogged, so it's got a bit of bare earth to germinate and get it going. So if you're a grass hater society president, grow a heap of it. This one might be for you, Nigel. How have you managed it when it has gotten away um, in terms of... We had it in 2020, well, it was further north near Tamworth, but where it got away and we couldn't, didn't have enough mouths to eat it and then it sort of choked it out the following year. Um, we tried some slashing trials and a few other things that did help, but, yeah, when you don't have enough mouths or a big enough bank account. Don't worry about it. I don't get hung up on it because you watch in the winter when you want somewhere to park cows that are in um, not calving, that are pregnant, you can put your cows on 20% Macosca brew, lock them in there, and they live on a loose lick at basically zero cost, and you park them there, and they stay shiny and fat all through winter, and every time you drive past, you go, what are they living on? But it's matching your class of grass to the class of animal. If you've let it get away and it's turned to cardboard, which is, to me, is just diesel, run an animal on there that loves living on diesel, not rocket fuel. So don't get hung up about it getting away on you. It's no big deal. You'll just harvest it in winter if you run out of tucker for animals that... dry animals that want to live on diesel fuel, which isn't young animals. So it's not the end of the world. Uh, Su Suzanne, Frank McRae, just wondering whether you've got any comments after recovery after fire. We've forgotten about fire a little bit after the last, you know, the last couple of wet years. So. Yeah, hi Frank. Um, the, there was quite a few digit um, paddocks which were burnt in the Warren Bungles fires and also in the Sir, I Sir Ivan fires up in northern New South Wales, and um, and they actually came back really really well. So um, yeah, didn't didn't have any issues. Um, they burnt hot, which is certainly an issue, um, or can be an issue, um, but their recovery was excellent. Radio. We might um, pull it up there. I think we've grilled you enough. Um, if I could just ask all our speakers from today, if they could just make their way up here, that'd be really good. That includes you, Nigel. Just a little um, token gesture of our appreciation for your work today. Thanks, mate. No worries. And uh, if we could just um, give them all a round of applause and thank them. <laughs> so um, that's pretty much the end of our day. And I won't bang on about the evaluation sheet, but we really need that evaluation sheet. So just outside that door, there is a little box. It's got evaluation form written on it. If you could poke that in there, that'd be excellent. Um, thank you to our speakers. Thank you to, for you all attending today. And for those of you who have hung on right to the end, we really appreciate that. Um, to the Range Centre, to our videographer, thanks very much. Um, and thanks to Martin, because he's been the driver of the ship organising this um, day, so he's done an excellent job and, yeah, well done. Good job. So, um, thank you all.